everybody. Welcome to Steelers Weekly presented by Geico. I'm Missy Matthews. Unfortunately, the Steelers week four matchup against the Tennessee Titans has been rescheduled for later this season. So tonight we want to take a look back at the Steelers newest class for their Hall of Honor. Since being founded in 1933, the Pittsburgh Steelers have become one of the National Football League's storied franchises. A tradition built by some of professional football's greatest players, the memorable plays they made, and the championships they won. And it's a touchdown for Pittsburgh on the ball of the Stalwarts. Starting in 2017, the franchise decided to recognize their legends by creating the Hall of Honor. To be a member of the Hall of Honor is to be a permanent part of Steelers history and to belong to the brotherhood responsible for the team's successes over the last 87 seasons. One of the great things about this Hall of Honor is that you're going in with guys that you know, guys that you accomplished a lot with, so this is something special. For players to be considered for induction, they must have played for the team for a minimum of three seasons compile noteworthy records or achievements during those seasons and be retired for at least three seasons. Coaches and administrators are considered based on significant contributions to the team and community. To say that you were one of the greatest to ever wear the, the black and gold, that means a lot to me. I want to thank all the men in this room that are being inducted with me because they set a standard for every player that came after them. The expectation was that you had to raise your level to meet that standard. To date, 36 former players, coaches, and contributors have been awarded the steel football that comes with induction into the Hall of Honor. And now, we announce the five members of the Class of 2020. This year's class includes defensive end Dwight White. Just matter time. Just matter time. The defensive end known as Mad Dog came to the Steelers as a fourth round pick of the 1971 draft. And as an original member of the Steel Curtain for 10 seasons, his 46 career sacks still ranks 10th on the Steelers all time list. The pinnacle of White's career came at the end of the 1974 season. After spending a week in a New Orleans hospital with pneumonia, White started and played a significant role in the win over the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl IX. He scored the game's first points by recording a safety en route to the Steelers' first of four Lombardi trophies in the 1970s. Seven rounds after the Steelers drafted White in 1971, they added a safety from Western Illinois named Mike Wagner. While White and his defensive line mates terrorized quarterbacks, Wagner and his secondary mates picked them clean. 36 interceptions and 12 fumble recoveries accounted for the 48 takeaways Wagner contributed during 10 NFL seasons. The two-time Pro Bowl selection added five more interceptions in the playoffs, including one in Super Bowl IX and another in Super Bowl X. In 1978, Wagner selflessly moved to free safety in order to make room and mentor a fellow member of the Hall of Honor in Donnie's show. Next up is James Ferrier. Ferrier arrived in Pittsburgh in 2002. <laughs> and he would leave with two Super Bowl rings and the reputation as one of the best free agent signings in franchise history. Ferrier led the Steelers in tackles during five of his 10 seasons as a starting inside linebacker. He was voted to the Pro Bowl twice and was a first team all pro in 2004. A team captain and respected leader, Ferrier finished his Steelers career with more than 1,000 tackles to go along with 30 sacks, eight interceptions, and 82 tackles for loss. Representing the era of the 80s and 90s is Greg Lloyd, a linebacker who wasn't hired for his disposition was in fact employed to attack opposing quarterbacks. To rush the quarterback. A force on the Steelers often dominating defenses of the 1990s. Lloyd accounted for 53 and a half sacks during his decade with the Steelers, which still ranks ninth all time in franchise history. 
Lloyd was voted first team all pro in three straight seasons from 1993 to 1995. He was one of the team's pioneers in mastering the blind side strip sack as illustrated by the 34 fumbles he forced. Lloyd's passion for the game and his relentless approach will define what it means to be a Steelers linebacker. Rounding out the 2020 class is a gold jacket recipient in waiting and one of the most beloved players in franchise history. Statistics alone cannot fully describe Troy Polamalu's impact on the Steelers or the sport he loved. A four-time first-team All-Pro and one of only five players in franchise history to be voted NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Polamalu's acrobatics and signature hair flowing from the back of his helmet were trademarks of his unique playing style. Polamalu finished with 32 career interceptions and he led or tied for the team lead six times in 12 seasons. Polamalu was voted to the NFL's All-Decade Team of the 2000s and he capped it all by becoming the ninth member of the Steelers franchise to become a first ballot Hall of Famer. These five men have represented what it means to wear the black and gold. Five men of steel added to the Pittsburgh Steelers Hall of Honor. Certainly all the classes that have been inducted prior to this one have all been stellar. Uh, Art, this one is just fantastic. Uh, five tremendous players, contributors to the Steeler legacy. And i just like some general thoughts on this particular class. You know, Stan, I think this is the first time that our class has included only players. As you know, in past years, we, we tended to have uh, either coach or scouts, you know, in, in the case of my uncle and Bill, none the one year. So uh, I, I believe this will be our first year where we're inducting only players, uh, people that actually their contribution was on the field. And, uh, you know, I think that's great. It, it recognizes, uh, you know, what, what a great number of players we've had. And, of course, uh, you know, this year we recognize uh, two sets of teammates, uh, you know, Dwight and, and Mike Wagner from the 70s and then, and then Troy and James uh, from the, the 2000s. Uh, uh, you know, bo both uh, sets of teammates played on Super Bowl championship teams. And uh, then you have Greg Lloyd in the middle there, and Greg was a – you know, significant player in the, the Bill Cower and Chuck Noll eras. So uh, really a great class and really excited to, uh, to have our fans see, uh, see this group come out. Stay right there. When we return, you'll hear from two members of this year's Hall of Honor class. Welcome back to Steelers Weekly presented by Geico. Let's head back over to Stan Savern for more on this year's Hall of Honor class. And we are thrilled to welcome in two members of the great Hall of Honor class of the year 2020, continuing the great linebacker tradition of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Greg Lloyd and James Ferrier. Guys, I knew that you were informed of your individual honors, but you're not aware of who else is in the class. So. If you'd like to congratulate one another, by all means, please go ahead. Hey, congratulations, James, man. Well deserved. Thank you, brother. And same to you, man. You were definitely one of the players I looked up to, man, when I was coming up. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a truly an honor to go in with you. Well, you guys took the cup and you ran with it, man, and you did something with it. So, you know, it made what we did. It made it worthwhile. Oh, man, I appreciate that. Those sincere words coming from you, man, I always – Always good, man. Greg, I want to start with you. I'm going to go age before beauty here, if that's okay, uh, with uh, not that much of a difference, but, uh, but, but somewhat. Uh, just if you can, Greg, describe uh, what this means to you uh, to be inducted into the Steelers Hall of Honor. Well, you know, I, I, I'm kind of at a loss for words. I think when I got informed, I got informed by art. Right, it's a funny story. Hopefully I can make it short. And I got a phone call. It was a missed call, and it was a 412 number. I said, that's a Pittsburgh number. Let me call it back. I called it back, and it's like, all right, Rooney's secretary. And I was like, okay, I got the wrong number. And so I hung up, and then she called me back. And she said, great, uh, do you have time to talk to Art? And then I started thinking, okay, 
I felt like I was in 11th grade and now I got to go see the principal because now I got to talk to the owner, Art, and I felt like, you know, a kid. So it's like, sure. And then, you know, when he said what he said, I was like, okay, I, I thought I was in trouble. I didn't know why he was called. So we laughed about it, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, he told me what was going on. And I, I was just, you know, I was really tickled because, you know, it was like in, in that name of the Hall of Famers that are in that hall in that first group. And then, you know, the other guys that were going in, you know, the Wagners and Dwight Whites, you know, and stuff like that. It was like, you know what, that is, that is something else. And I think being in Pittsburgh and understanding when you get there, when, when, when I first got there, what that Steeler defense was about, what Steeler football was about, was implanted in me and imputed in me by one of the greatest was Joe Green, who's coached there. And knowing how to practice and knowing what to do, being intimidated, you know, when you're on the field, as well sometimes off the field, you know, you have to, you have to do that to set precedence. And um, I thought that was, you know, the whole time I was there, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to resonate you know, about, about, about playing Steelers, whether we won or whether we lost, when you got done, you were going, you're going to know you were in a fight. It was black and blue. And, um, you know, if you won the game, you, you definitely were going to lose, you know, lose the war because, you know, you didn't want to come back to Pittsburgh anymore. So that's what I wanted to leave there. And, uh, to be, um, in the hall says that, you know, you know, I did my job. Well, you personified the kind of defense that has been played around here for decades and continues until today. We're going to talk about that uh, in, in just a bit. And you continued that legacy and, and, frankly, enhanced it as you went along. James, you came along a few years later. Uh, but let me ask you initially, when you got word that you had been uh, selected for this class, what were your initial reactions? Well, you know, it's a, kind of a similar story to Greg's. And you know, I, I see the 412 number and I usually don't answer my phone if I, don't, if I don't have the name saved in the phone, but I saw it was from Pittsburgh. So I said, let me see. And I, I, I heard the voice and knew who it was right away. And then just like Greg said, I thought like, oh no, what's going on? Why is he calling me? <laughs> and then when he told me the news, I was just speechless. Like Greg said, man, it pretty much, you know, when you think of that, history of the team and the legacy of, you know, the players and the organization and what a great uh, town to be in and all those things put together. And you think about the group of guys that you're going in with, uh, it's really something special. Welcome back to Steelers Weekly as we recap the Steelers 2020 Hall of Honor class. Let's rejoin Stan Saverin. The expectations for a sixth round draft choice out of Fort Valley State under normal circumstances would not be great if you were making odds. And for you to go from where you started and where you are today, does it even make it more remarkable? Uh, you know, you weren't a number one draft choice like James was with the Jets. Um, what a journey you've had. And I, I wonder if that um, has or continues to register with you. Well, absolutely. You know, coming in from, you know, you, when you, you know, you said, you know, mentioned uh, my college, Fort Valley State College, HBCU. And the thing of it is, you know, coming from, you know, uh, you know, a black college football in the NFL was a, you know, in some people's mind, it wasn't as good as D1 and things of that nature. So right away, when you hear that, it's almost like you got something to prove. And, you know, shouldn't have to when, when you have the, you know, the Mel Blunts and you have the Donny Shells and, you know, and the John Stallworth that have come, you know, through Pittsburgh along with, you know, other guys. But the thing was, you know, you play with a chip on your shoulder, but you think about the beginning of my career, it really should have ended in the beginning. You know, my, my, my second day or first day of training camp, you know, I had, I got my knee torn. I had total reconstruction knee surgery. How many people have total reconstruction knee surgery and return and play football? And the very next year, the very last game of preseason, I tore my ACL in my right knee. So right then, I'm 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 a liability to Pittsburgh Steelers. And all I can remember was the very first time you know, when I had I was in the hospital, the very first person that came to see me was the chief. 
I met the chief in the hospital with my leg up in the air. I didn't know that he knew me. I didn't know who he was. But when he left, I kind of like, okay, I know who he is. I seen that face on some, you know, so you know, some billboards and, and some things around, you know, you know, around the stadium. So my thing was, you know, I had a lot to prove. You know, I had to prove to the Pittsburgh Steelers that I wasn't a liability, that I was an asset. James, your circumstance was different. Number one draft choice out of Virginia with the Jets. Kevin Colbert and Bill Cowher signed you uh, 2002. Um, whatever happened with the Jets, did the transformation from outside linebacker to inside linebacker, did that make you feel more comfortable? And what was the discussion when they did decide to move you inside in the 3-4? Well, uh, definitely when I uh, decided to sign with Pittsburgh, uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Coach Cowell for giving me a job. Uh, <laughs> because, yeah, I, I was a free agent at the time going through the process. And, you know, it was training camp was pretty much around the corner. I hadn't signed with any team. So, you know, they gave me a chance and gave me a shot. And, you know, to be in this position now is 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 overwhelming. And, you know, it, I, I really haven't been able to digest it all and think about everything that, you know, I've been through throughout my career. And Pittsburgh was definitely a place that changed. I think it changed my attitude about football and being around those guys and being in that locker room and around the culture just changed the way I felt when I went out on the football field and it showed up, you know, in the way I played. You were a part of some great defenses, obviously two Super Bowl defenses. Um, they were tremendous, and there was an amazing cast around you, James. Oh my goodness! I, I mean, there's so many names I can't even. I don't. I don't even want to start to even try to mention anybody's name. But that, the teams that I were, were a part of were some of the best teams that, you know, I could have ever been imagined myself being a part of. And you know, winning two Super Bowls, that just was icing on the cake. But you know. Coach Coward used to always say it's not about the uh, it's always about the journey. And, you know, looking back on our careers now, it is it, definitely all the moments that lead up to the spectacular moments at the end. And, you know, all those moments I would cherish for the rest of my life. And, you know, being a part of the, the hall is something that, you know, I don't think it can get any better than this. Weekly is presented by Geico, where 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on your car insurance. Guys, let me finish with this. Um, you both played on fantastic defenses, and it's only two games into this particular season, and we're probably shy of talking Steel Curtain or maybe even one of your defenses, James, or, or yours, Greg. Uh, but this 2020 Steeler defense. Um, has all the makings of a great defense. Um, they're as fast a defense, I think, uh, as I've ever seen in covering the Steelers for 45 years. I wonder if you've had a chance to see any of this group's Steelers games and, uh, James, what you think of, of this particular defense. Uh, like you said, they have all the pieces in place, and the first thing that jumps out, of you, out at you when you're watching them is their speed. And like you said, when you have that – that type of amazing speed, uh, it allows you to do a lot of things and they're going to be a dangerous team. I think it, it more, the more time they spend together, the more time they are out on the field, you know, getting gelling together, it's, it's just going to all come together. And sky's the limit for this group. I think they, they had the potential to be probably one of the best ever. Greg? Well, I haven't watched a lot of it. Again, I get I get a lot of what, what what happens in football from from my good friend Kevin Green. And I think during one of the games he called me, he texted me and said, Man, did you see, you know, JJ Watt and the other outside linebacker meet in the backfield and almost kill the quarterback? And I'm going, No, I didn't see it. You know, I'm not watching it. But you know, in any I think I think when you begin and when you start a comparison, I think anytime you start, you know, comparing teams, you you have to you know, give it a, give it a, give it a little bit of time. And I, and I kind of echo what James says, you know, with speed, you know, it comes preparation. You know, you can play extremely fast if you're prepared, there's no hesitation. So it sounds to me as if um, coach has everybody 
locked in with what they're supposed to do with all of their, you know, they're doing all the, the right things in the classroom. And that allows you to fly around and play fast. And as long as they can do that and prevent any kind of injuries, then the sky's the limit of what these guys can do. Of course, I bleed black and gold here in this Falcon country, but I bleed, I bleed black and gold. And so I want them to do well. And I feel like if I watch Pittsburgh, they do bad. When I don't watch them and I come back and see the score, they've won. So I don't want to jinx them. So I don't, I, if, they're, if I turn and they're winning and it's like, okay, and then all of a sudden something happens, I'm like, okay, I got to turn it off and I just go and do something. I come back and I look at the score and I go, okay, they won. You know, okay. So that's how I am. So I'm kind of superstitious about that because, you know, planning that defense, you see some things that you think can be better and can be done better. And I don't ever want to be an armchair linebacker or quarterback or anything like that. So I let them have fun. You know, I listen, man, these guys, like I said, you know, I, I want them to run around and, you know, and play fast and have fun. And, you know, if they can be the best defense ever, you know, and I say kudos, go for it. Well, if you feel like you not watching helps the Steelers win, I'm sure everybody in Steelers Nation watching is worldwide right now. I'd be more than happy to send you a text and let you know how things went. Uh, if, you can, if you can maintain that discipline. <laughs> Guys, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to do this today. Uh, again, Steeler Nation all over the world is going to be able to see this and is watching this as we talk right now. Uh, and on behalf of everyone, sincere congratulations, well-deserved and well-earned. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching Steelers Weekly presented by Geico. We'll see you next week.